Thank you to everyone around the world for joining us for this week's Immunome Lab meeting and Happy New Year. My name is Kristen Abood. I am the science editor at the Human Immunome Project and I will be your moderator today. Artificial intelligence was certainly on everyone's minds as 2022 drew to a close, particularly following the release of Chat, BT, Chat GPT chatbot from OpenAI at the end of November. And while using AI to write poems or essays can be fun, this webinar series is focused on the overlap of machine learning and immunology in an effort to improve human health. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We kicked off the Immunome Lab Meeting webinar series last year with two excellent talks. And if you missed those sessions, I encourage you to visit our website, humanimmunomeproject.org to view the recordings. This week, we continue showcasing the research of leading scientists who are working at the frontiers of AI and human immunology with an exciting talk on how we can use artificial intelligence to better predict the response to cancer immunotherapy. Before we get started, I'd like you to please note that the information presented today includes pre-published data. At the request of our speaker, we ask that you do not reproduce or disseminate the data presented in today's webinar in any way. Thank you so much for your understanding. And now without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Anant Matabushi, a professor of biomedical engineering and a faculty member in the departments of pathology, biomedical informatics, and radiology and imaging sciences at Emory University. Dr. Matabushi is also a research health scientist at the Atlanta Veterans Administration Medical Center. He has authored more than 450 peer-reviewed publications and has more than 100 patents either issued or pending in the areas of artificial intelligence, computer-aided diagnoses, and computer vision, among other fields. His work on smart imaging computers for identifying lung cancer patients who need chemotherapy was named one of the top 10 medical breakthroughs of 2018 by Prevention Magazine. And in 2019, Nature hailed him as one of five scientists developing offbeat and innovative approaches for cancer research. During today's presentation, I ask that you please send any questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. I will ask our speaker a broad selection of your questions after the presentation, and we will have some time for discussion. With that, it is my pleasure to now turn it over to Dr. Anant Matabushi. Thank you very much, Kristen, for that uh, very kind introduction. All right, great. Um, so just want to start off with um, a disclosure before I go into my formal disclosures. I'm not an immunologist. I know very, very little about immunology. Um, but I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of people who do know a lot more about cancer immunology. And so this work really represents um, some of the work that we've done in the application of AI to cancer immunology, but more I, I, I um, would propose sort of an aspirational viewpoint of what could be or what can be with AI um, as we look at um, cancer immunology. And hopefully I'll be able to convey and suggest opportunities outside cancer as well. So to the more formal disclosures, I am a co-founder and equity holder in Picture Health, a company that has licensed some of the technologies I'll be talking about today. I also serve on scientific advisory boards for a few companies, and we have a number of sponsored research agreements with pharmaceutical companies. Uh, I guess my true disclosure is the fact that I do have a social media account. That's my Twitter handle. Uh, for those of you on Twitter, if any of what I talk about today is remotely appealing, uh, please feel free to give me a follow. So I want to set the context a little bit for my talk with uh, reproducing some statistics that I'm sure a number of you are aware of. I was pretty uh, stunned a few years ago when I found out that the um, probability of uh, a man in the United States being diagnosed with some form of cancer in his lifetime was 50%. For women, it's marginally better with a statistic of one in three which effectively means that 40% of the adult population in the United States would be diagnosed with some form of cancer in their lifetime. However, when you look at the actual mortality statistics on account of cancer, 
Um, and, and not to be little or trivialize 600,000 deaths per year on account of some form of cancer. There clearly is a discordance between 600,000 people dying because of the disease or, or diseases of cancer every year vis-a-vis -vis this diagnostic incidence rate of about 40% in the adult population. And of course, there are certain reasons why there is such a large uh, discrepancy between these two numbers. One, the fact that we've become more aggressive about early screening. We are uh, using imaging as well as biomarkers for early screening and early detection. And we know that early detection of cancer helps save lives. Uh, we do know that um, the use of better treatments that we have in our arsenal today has dramatically improved the uh, survivorship of uh, a number of cancer patients, treatments like immunotherapy that I'll talk about today. But if you're completely honest, we have to acknowledge that at least part of the reason for the chasm between the mortality vis-a-vis -vis the actual diagnostic incidence is the fact that we are over-diagnosing and over-treating a number of cancers today. And perhaps uh, a great example of this is really in the, is, is prostate cancer, a disease that affects one in seven men in the United States annually, but only one in 40 will actually succumb to it. And yet we throw the proverbial kitchen sink in terms of treatment for these men with prostate cancer. We treat them with surgery, we treat them with radiation therapy, treatments that are invasive, that do have toxic side effects associated with them. And this is in spite of the fact that the vast majority of men with prostate cancer will die with prostate cancer as opposed to on account of prostate cancer. If we're being completely honest, we have to acknowledge that at least in the United States, apart from the toxicity on account of the treatments, there is also the very real issue of financial toxicity. These are some staggering statistics that are slightly dated now. I, I uh, suspect strongly that uh, the numbers are even worse uh, today in 2023. Um, but from 2018, we know that 42% of new cancer patients will lose their life savings. A number of cancer patients will lose uh, their life savings within one year of that initial cancer diagnosis. And driven by the patient-centric toxicity as well as the financial toxicity, in our group, we've been looking at the use of artificial intelligence with routinely acquired data. And I'll talk about radiology scans, I'll talk about pathology scans, to not just help in better diagnostics, not just in helping identifying the presence of our absence of disease, but really looking at ways in which we can risk stratify disease better. Can we predict disease outcome and progression better? And then more critically, from a clinical perspective, what can we do in terms of predicting response to treatment and benefit of treatment? Because at the end of the day, it's really the use of these AI-driven prognostic predictive tools that will truly help us realize the promise of precision medicine. One of the things that has uh, become abundantly clear over the last um, couple of decades is the fact that there is a tremendous amount of information that is latent in routinely acquired biopsy slides, H&E slides. And with, this, with the digitization of glass slides, it has become possible because of whole slide scanners. Uh, that has ushered in a true revolution in AI for digital pathology. And what that has really allowed uh, scientists uh, like myself and others to start to do is to use machine vision, machine learning algorithms, and start to apply to digital images of H&E glass slides uh, to be able to start to pull out information that goes above and beyond what a pathologist or a human reader might be able to discern from these slides. And so you, here you see an example of a routine H&E slide of, of cancer and with the use of machine vision, one can start to identify the individual lymphocytes and start to look at the spatial architecture and spatial arrangement of the individual immune cells. One can start to look at the textural appearance of the different tissue compartments, looking at the stroma, looking at the epithelium, and also starting to analyze the textural and the heterogeneity of the individual nuclei, really capturing the chromatin patterns within the individual nuclei using textural and mathematical features really providing a series of quantitative metrics that now allow for a very deep digital description of tumor morphology in a hitherto unprecedented fashion. And so about 15 years ago, uh, I had the good fortune of meeting and, and collaborating with Dr. Sridhar Ganesan, a breast oncologist at Rutgers University. And Sridhar was looking at some of the algorithms we were developing in the context of H&E slides for cancer grading. 
And uh, Sridhar, an oncologist, looked at the work and said, you know, Nant, it's very impressive what you're doing, but you know, as an oncologist, my pain point is knowing how to treat people. Uh, in breast cancer, where a number of breast cancer patients end up receiving chemotherapy, where they actually will not benefit from chemotherapy or they don't need the chemotherapy, we need better ways of being able to identify which women can avoid, safely avoid chemotherapy vis-a-vis -vis those women that actually will benefit from the chemotherapy. And so we came up with uh, this idea of the image-based risk score, where the idea was that taking the biopsies and slides associated with the tissue, that could then be digitized using whole slide scanners. And having digitized those slides, those images could then be analyzed via machine learning, machine vision algorithms. And a series of quantitative features could then be prized out from these slides, which could then be associated with treatment benefit and treatment response. Now, one of the things I also became aware of was that there were molecular assays out there to try to address this particular issue. Oncotype DX is probably the most famous of these. A 21 gene expression-based assay to help identify which early stage ER positive breast cancer patients would benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy versus women who could safely avoid adjuvant chemotherapy. The challenge with these gene expression-based assays is the fact that they're expensive, they're tissue destructive, and they need physical shipping of the tissue blocks uh, to a centralized location. And so our idea was, well, could we start to interrogate these slides with machine learning algorithms so that now you could do this image assessment of risk and benefit of therapy in a completely digital fashion? Uh, in other words, you wouldn't require physical shipping of tissue. You wouldn't need to destroy any tissue. You could do this in a, in a uh, non-destructive fashion. Uh, and that uh, was uh, the big sort of opportunity that we, um, we saw and started to work on. Now, one of the first things that we recognized that we needed to do was to go in and identify the cells of interest, uh, lymphocytes, cancer nuclei. And around 10 years ago, deep learning, which of course uses neural networks, a concept that's been around for over 60 years, increasing uh, sophistication in computational hardware as well as algorithms. And neural networks now could be tethered together in different unique innovative ways. And the way these neural networks were combined together and stood up uh, resulted in different architectures, different networks. And this is sort of the bludgeoning area or field of deep learning where you've got all of these neural networks stacked on top of each other and it provides a really uh, unique, unsupervised uh, manner of generating representations associated with the target of interest. So you see here an example of work that we published near, now about nearly a decade ago, where in one of the first applications of deep learning to digital pathology, we trained a particular kind of deep learning algorithm called a stacked sparse autoencoder, uh, provided a series of images where we annotated the individual cells the, uh, the, the, the deep learning network was then able to identify representations associated with these cells and was then able to spit out the precise location of these cells on uh, new unseen images. So the beauty of this uh, particular category of approaches is the fact that you don't really need a lot of domain knowledge. You don't really need to know uh, the pathobiology of the disease, uh, but having the annotations of the target of interest and providing a discovery or a training set to the network the network then is able to learn in a largely unsupervised fashion. And these algorithms now have become pretty uh, efficient and, and, and relatively fast. And here's an example from some of our work on uh, just off the shelf hardware, where we are able to go in and identify hundreds of thousands of lymphocytes on these h &E images fairly rapidly. And this has allowed uh, for you know, phenotyping of these images in a very uh, quick, uh, rigorous manner. Now, having said that, one of the challenges with deep learning, which of course is a particular category of machine learning algorithms, is the opacity of the representations that are prized out by these networks. So the network learns a representation associated with the target of interest, but what it learns tends to be fairly abstract. It tends to be fairly opaque. And hence, a lot of these approaches often are called black box approaches. Now, they become very widespread and and, and extremely powerful and, and very useful for a number of domains. But there is a recognition, particularly in medicine, particularly in the biomedical sciences, that there is a challenge in being able to really understand 
how this AI works, how deep learning works, what these representations mean. And particularly when it, uh, when it applies to medicine and health, there is a challenge because you know, how, do you, how do you trust an algorithm where you don't really understand the representations? Um, how do you really trust the decisions being made by this more black box, opaque class of deep learning algorithms? And so in our group, we've um, tried to sort of have the proverbial cake as well as eat it, because we're looking at a blend of deep learning, but also what are called handcrafted machine learning approaches, where we're using the power of deep learning to do a deep phenotyping of the image. In other words, using the power of deep learning to segment out the structures of interest, the different tissue compartments, the individual cells, the lymphocytes, the cancer nuclei, et cetera, et cetera. But having done that, what we are now trying to do is to look at more interpretable patterns and interpretable features that can be then prized out from these images that really capture the morphology, but does it in an interpretable and intuitive way. So for instance, having segmented out all the individual nuclei and lymphocytes within the stroma, within the epithelium, now we can start to look at graph and network-based approaches to look at the spatial architecture and the spatial arrangement and the interplay of lymphocytes and cancer cells you can do that in the stroma, you can do that in the epithelium, and essentially create these digital biomarkers that can then be associated with outcome and treatment response. So it's, it's melding the power of the more opaque black box approaches to do the segmentation. But having done that, we're then extracting the more interpretable features. And so what I'll really focus on for my talk today are some exemplars of this category of more interpretable uh, intuitive deep learning or sort of interpretable machine learning and machine vision based approaches. And um, I'll, I'll go through some examples, but what we've shown in our work is that this class of uh, deep phenotyping, which is a meld of the deep learning and the interpretable handcrafted machine learning approaches, uh, it can be really beneficial across multiple different indications uh, to predict treatment response. And I won't go through all the various different combinations uh, that you see on the slide here. Uh, but we really demonstrated across a plurality of different indications that you can see on the left, across multiple different drug groups and drug types. And you can see that here, uh, as well as associated combinations uh, to the right, uh, that this class of approaches, applying it to just h and &E images can really have a significant impact on treatment response and treatment benefit. And so I'll just pepper you with a few examples across these different conditions over the next few slides. So I want to start off with a breast cancer example that I referenced a couple of slides ago, where we took a more interpretable approach. First, again, using the power of deep learning to go and phenotype the image, identify individual cancer cells, identify tubules, identify mitotic figures, but then really creating a uh, interpretable measure of uh, nuclear pleomorphism, tubule count, and mitotic count. So essentially, by First, doing the segmentation, we're then able to come up with a metric that a pathologist, an oncologist is able to understand. You know, what is the diversity in the shape and the appearance of the individual nuclei? What is the density of the tubules in these slides? What is the density of the mitotic count in these slides? We're then able to take these measurements and use it in conjunction with a machine classifier to now prognosticate outcome in uh, ER positive, estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. And so uh, this is work that's currently under review, but we've demonstrated on a plurality of sites, both in the US as well as in India, that this uh, very interpretable machine classifier allows for prognosticating outcome, uh, both in lymph node negative ER positive breast cancer patients, but also lymph node positive ER positive breast cancer patients. And why that's beneficial is because, uh, again, we, you know, I talked about the Oncotype DX test, which is this molecular based test that's tissue destructive and has been validated in its benefit of uh, chemotherapy for uh, women with breast cancer. Uh, the Oncotype, the way it works is that it provides a risk score. And if you have a low risk score, essentially it suggests that you're not going to benefit from chemotherapy. You can avoid chemotherapy. On the other hand, if you have a high risk score, it means that you probably will need the chemotherapy. Well, what we did was we looked at a cohort of patients who had, had the Oncotype score, um, and then apply the image-based risk score for further risk categorization within those buckets. So in other words, we looked at patients who had a low oncotype score, applied the image-based risk score, and found, interestingly, that even within patients who had a low oncotype score, there were a subset of patients that had 
uh, poor outcome, suggesting that in hindsight, these women who the IBRIS classifier identified as having high risk could have benefited from adjuvant chemotherapy. Of course, this, is, this was retrospective. And so therefore, uh, you know, in hindsight, these women might have benefited from chemotherapy. But what we also found is that patients with high oncotype, again, women that oncotype is saying um, should be receiving chemotherapy, we were able to identify a subset of patients that actually had really good outcome, had, um, had um, uh, you know, favorable survival characteristics, again, suggesting that in hindsight, perhaps they did not uh, need to have um, been offered or given chemotherapy, and they could have possibly benefited just from surgery and hormonal therapy alone. So an example of where a simple image classifier working of h &E slides can add significant value to this more expensive molecular-based test. Um, one of the critical things that we've recognized is the importance of validating these approaches on completed clinical trials. And we're, we're working very closely with a number of cooperative groups. Uh, and this is some data with SWOG S8814 that was recently presented at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Meeting, where we demonstrated that the image classifier uh, could significantly stratify the low risk and the high risk groups uh, and, and SWOG S8814 was a completed clinical trial of uh, ER positive, lymph node positive breast cancer patients. But it's not just invasive ductal, uh, invasive uh, breast cancer. DCIS is uh, the so-called pre-malignancy or pre-invasive uh, breast cancer. And here using machine learning, uh, we've been able to capture the immune cells on standard h &E images and essentially shown that with AI and machine learning, we can stratify DCIS into a high till uh, group as well as a low till group. And what is really interesting in this uh, data and in this publication that we're about to submit uh, very soon uh, for, for publication uh, is that we, we showed not only that there were significant survival differences and risk of progression to invasive ductal carcinoma between the high tail group, that is uh, those, um, uh, those women with a larger number of lymphocytes versus uh, women with a smaller number or lower number of lymphocytes. Uh, what we also were able to demonstrate was that there was a treatment benefit between the high tail group and the low tail group. In other words, we found there were significant um, uh, differences in, in the benefit to women who had high tail and low tail and that uh, potentially women who had high tails uh, may not really benefit from radiation therapy. And that's a big deal because that suggests that uh, women with this particular tail phenotype in DCIS could potentially safely avoid radiation therapy. The nice thing here is again, we actually were able to work with a cooperative group in the UK and validate retrospectively um, this particular signature um, on this uh, completed uh, clinical trial. And so demonstrate not just the prognostic benefit of this immune signature, but also the predictive benefit in terms of radiotherapy. So you can look at the till count and you can quantify high tills and low tills on an h &E image, but can you do more than that? And this was a question that we explored a few years ago. Herman Corridor, an instructor in our group, demonstrated very nicely in a paper in clinical cancer research that it wasn't just the number of tills, but really the spatial interplay between tills and cancer nuclei that was strongly associated with recurrence in early stage lung cancer. And so what we did here was to use, again, machine learning and deep learning to identify cancer cells and lymphocytes on standard h &E images. So what you're seeing here are not quantitative immunofluorescence or immunohistochemistry images. These are standard h &E images but the uh, machine learning algorithm has been able to identify exactly where the cancer cells are. And you can see the green dots, uh, the, sorry, the, the, the red dots represent the cancer cells, the green dots represent the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And we, having identified those individual cells, we then use clustering algorithms to create clusters of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Uh, these are the green clusters. Uh, as well as create clusters of the cancer nuclei, and these are the red clusters. And what you see here is that the spatial interplay between the green and the red clusters are quite different between patients that don't have recurrence vis-a-vis -vis patients who do have recurrence. One of the striking things that you notice is that the lymphocytic clusters tend to be fairly large and sort of almost provide a mothering effect or an enveloping effect around the cancer cell clusters 
um, almost suggesting that they're preventing the breakout of these cancer cells uh, and, and therefore suppressing metastasis and progression. On the other hand, when you look at patients who do have recurrence, you're seeing larger dominant nuclear cancer cell clusters and smaller fragmented till clusters, which don't seem to have quite the same sort of mothering effect around the uh, cancer cell clusters. And we showed that these spatial statistics, quantitative statistics that capture this interplay were strongly associated with risk of recurrence in early stage non-small cell lung cancer. In a follow-on paper to this study that uh, we published last year, uh, we wanted to further understand whether this TIL signature, the spatial TIL signature was consistent across different uh, subtypes of lung cancer. So we looked both at adenocarcinomas as well as squamous cell cancers. And working with Kurt Schalper and, the, and, and David Rim and others at Yale University, we looked at a series of squamous cell cancers and adenocarcinomas. We looked at the h &E, but we also had corresponding quantitative immunofluorescence images. So we could do the immune subtyping of these immune cells on the corresponding um, uh, QMIF. And we did a tight co-registration between the h &E images and the QMIF uh, slides. And what uh, we were able to do in this uh, particular study was first to phenotype the arrangement of the immune cells on the adenocarcinomas as well as squamous cell cancers. And one of the things that we found was that uh, till density turned out to be more important and more prognostically relevant in adenocarcinomas, architecture and interplay between cancer cells and immune cells seemed to be more important in the context of squamous cell cancers. Having co-registered this uh, with the um, uh, quantitative immunofluorescence images, we found that in terms of immune cell composition, we found that there was a, a higher density of CD4 positive cells in adenocarcinomas uh, versus uh, squamous cell cancers, where we saw uh, that there was uh, a, a higher expression of both CD4 positive as well as CD8 positive cells. So the nice thing here was we didn't just stop at the h &E, we actually took it further and connected it with the quantitative immunofluorescence, so providing more sort of insight on, into the immune subtypes that we were capturing from the h &E images. So I talked about the prognostic benefit in the last couple of slides and in a follow-on paper in, um, to the clinical cancer research paper uh, was uh, this paper that we published in, in Lancet eBiomedicine a couple of years ago, where we demonstrated that the spatial till architecture was not just prognostic, but also predictive for added benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy in early stage non-small cell lung cancer. So just like I showed with the work that we've done in breast cancer, we demonstrated that in early stage non-small cell lung cancer, that the spatial till motif um, could uh, provide benefit uh, or could help identify those uh, lung cancer patients that would truly uh, receive added benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. So looking at stage 1A, 1B, and some stage 2 patients, we were able to demonstrate in a, retrospective in a retrospective study that patients who had received surgery alone, that we could identify a subset uh, based on the h &E images, that there were a subset of patients who were going to have poorer outcome and therefore in hindsight could have benefited from adjuvant chemotherapy. And then looking at patients who got surgery plus chemotherapy, um, looking back, we were able to identify a subset of patients that had much better outcome, much better survival advantage, and therefore in hindsight could have possibly avoided the adjuvant chemotherapy. In a more recent paper, this actually just came out over Thanksgiving, we looked at, uh, or actually uh, last summer, um, in, in science advances, we took the spatial till signature to try to see whether we could predict response to immunotherapy. Uh, this was a relatively small study, about 220 patients, but we did have data from uh, four or five sites. And in all of these, we had biopsies corresponding to lung cancer patients who went on to receive immunotherapy. Uh, they received a variety of different uh, immunotherapy drugs, including atezolizumab, uh, pembrolizumab, as well as nivolumab. In every case, we digitized the images, looked at the spatial arrangement and spatial architecture of the immune cells, and showed a couple of things. One, that we could predict response to um, immunotherapy uh, based off the spatial tail signature from the baseline biopsies, and that uh, this the signature uh, turned out to be um, uh, fairly robust uh, and consistent across different sites. But perhaps uh, even more pleasing was the fact that we were able to demonstrate the association with overall survival across different uh, IO drugs. So looking at Pembro, Nevo, as well as Atezo. Again, relatively small numbers here, uh, but even these small numbers, you're seeing 
we could separate out patients who had more favorable survival versus poorer survival um, across these different uh, drug um, uh, and uh, IO agents. Uh, one other piece that we found that was really interesting in this particular uh, study from last year was that when we looked at uh, patients who had uh, a low PDL1, so now these are patients who typically um, are either not offered immunotherapy or if they're offered immunotherapy, it's typically in combination uh, with chemo, that we were able to risk clarify two distinct groups within the low PDL1 setting. So, in other words, we were able to identify a subset of patients that were low risk and a subset of patients that were high risk and showed very clear separation between these two risk groups. And the, the benefit of that is the fact that in the low risk group, um, these are potentially patients who, even though they're low PDL1, uh, could possibly be offered mono IO therapy. So, in other words, it could potentially forego the more toxic chemotherapy, even though they're low PDL1. A uh, few more examples from our work in uh, the context of this sort of immune characterization uh, for cancer therapy. This is a work that's not been published yet, but it's a, it's a variant on the spatial architecture of tails that I previously showed, where we've actually been able to identify individual clusters of the immune lymphocytes. Now, we know, for instance, that not all lymphocytes are the same. You've got the activated lymphocytes, uh, you've got the exhausted cells, uh, you've got the bystander cells. And the idea here on this particular project was, could we identify on the HMEs alone these different clusters that might have different uh, levels of activation? And what we were able to do was using features related to the appearance, the shape, the size of the, uh, of the tills, excuse me, on the HNE images, we were able to identify individual clusters. We were able to link specific clusters with outcomes. So in other words, instead of using all the lymphocytes, we were able to identify partitions and clusters of lymphocytes that were more strongly associated with outcome in lung cancer patients. Um, and in some very initial uh, experiments uh, where we've again looked at the association between these clusters with the corresponding immune clusters on quantitative immunofluorescence images, we've identified that what we seem to be picking up are the more activated cells, whereas the uh, sort of the, um, the, the bystander cells, the exhausted cells, uh, immune cells tend to sort of form their own distinct cluster. Uh, and we've demonstrated not just the prognostic benefit, uh, but also predictive benefit. And this was a collaboration with uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, where we've shown that this uh, signature seems to be associated with overall survival in lung cancer patients treated with nivolumab. So this was the Checkmate 057 trial where the signature has now been validated on. I uh, just wanna keep moving along. Uh, this is a work that we published last year uh, with, um, with Kurt Schalper and his group where uh, we now actually switched from looking just in h &E to quantitative immunofluorescence. Essentially what uh, the idea here was to try to come up with metrics of heterogeneity of the different immune cell types. So we looked at the CD4 positive, CD8 positive, CD20, as well as the tumor cells, and, and came up with a way of capturing the disorder or heterogeneity of the immune composition and the tumor cell composition, not on the h &E, but directly on the quantitative immunofluorescence. And so we used um, a spatial statistic uh, called the Rouse index to capture the diversity of the immune cells and the species diversity, and showed uh, that there was a strong association between the Rau index, which captures this diversity of the different immune cell types uh, with outcome in patients treated with immunotherapy. So the question then was, um, could you try to recreate um, in an automated way what a quantitative immunofluorescence image might look like? And this is unpublished data, but just want to share with you some again, aspirational uh, views of what uh, could be with artificial intelligence. This is work that's being led by Chris Barrera, a graduate student in my group, uh, who's trying to train an AI algorithm to try to predict what a CD4 positive, a CD8 positive cell might look like directly from an h &E. And what we're doing is a careful co-registration of h &E images and quantitative immunofluorescence. So we're able to map the labels from the uh, quantitative immunofluorescence images directly onto the H&E images. And now on a cell-by-cell -cell basis, we've got 
uh, the ability to identify what that cell, um, what a CD4 or CD8 positive cell looks like on the h &E. And so we're using this to train the algorithm to directly predict uh, immune cell composition from an h &E without necessarily having the corresponding quantitative immunofluorescence image. Um, not quite there yet, don't have too much data to show, but just wanted to, uh, again, show you what this could look like and what the opportunities are in cancer immunology with AI. All right, a um, few other examples and other indications. Uh, this is work that we published last year in JNCI where we demonstrated uh, that the spatial till architecture uh, was associated with outcome in the context of head and neck cancers. Uh, we've also demonstrated, uh, not just in the context of lung cancer, but that the spatial till architecture um, uh, signature that we had was also associated with response to immunotherapy and gynecologic cancers. This is work that we published last year um, and uh, showed again that there was an association in uh, patients uh, who had been treated with nivolumab in the context of endometrial ovarian as well as cervical cancer. There was an association between this spatial till signature and progression-free survival. One of the other questions that we've been asking is, now are there potentially morphologic differences in the immune signature between, between different populations? And this was work that was presented at the ASCO meeting a couple of years ago. Uh, a manuscript based on this is about to go out. Um, and what was uh, the, the question that we were trying to understand was, given the, the fact that African-American women tend to be diagnosed with endometrial cancer and uterine cancer at a rate that's about three times observed in Caucasian American women, are there potentially morphologic differences between these populations? And while I will be the first to submit that race is a socio-political legal construct, uh, the, the, the use of race is helpful in terms of defining populations. And so even though we use the construct of race to define populations, what was interesting in the study was we found that there were differences in the immune cell architecture and the TIL architecture between African-American and Caucasian-American women. That in turn allowed us to create more tailored models for predicting outcome, specifically in African-American women. We actually showed that if you used a TIL signature that was population agnostic, it didn't actually prognosticate risk of recurrence in uh, African-American women. However, if you created a population specific model for African-American women based on that particular TIL signature, uh, then that actually turned out to be highly uh, prognostic uh, of risk of recurrence in, in African-American women. So uh, this is something that we are continuing to explore, but it suggests uh, that uh, AI might need to get more nuanced in uh, the kind of differences that might manifest across different populations. And it's not just oncology. So I want to give you a quick example. This is a work we've been doing with Elliot Paster and Ken Margellis at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, this was uh, published a couple of years ago in the European Heart Journal, where we showed on 2,300 patients who had um, undergone endomyocardial biopsies for cardiac transplants, that the spatial arrangement of the immune cells uh, with respect to cardiomyocytes uh, was uh, strongly implicated in the risk of rejection. And we actually showed that this uh, spatial interplay between the immune cells and cardiomyocytes actually allowed for prediction of cardiac rejection grade. Uh, in, in a way that was actually better or superior compared to cardiac pathologists. So very, very uh, promising findings uh, in terms of uh, patients undergoing cardiac transplant and, and shows further the applications of this kind of approach outside just oncology. And this is a work that, um, well, a couple of years ago, I think uh, just like everybody else, we were working on COVID. Um, and we looked at um, just trying to understand whether with AI, with machine vision, we could try to characterize just from h &E images what the immune architecture looked like. And so we looked at a, a series of uh, patients who, um, who died because of H1N1 versus COVID-19 and just compared uh, quantitatively the immune uh, architecture and the spatial aggregates of immune cells uh, from autopsy uh, images uh, or, or images of patients who had been autopsied and found that there were significant differences. The HN1N1 patients tended to have larger aggregates of lymphocytes compared to COVID-19 patients. So in the last few minutes, I wanted to very quickly uh, transition over from pathology to radiology. And I think uh, the title of my talk was 
you know, AI and cancer um, uh, immunotherapy across length scales. And so we've spent a lot of time looking at tissue and looking at immune cells at a microscopic scale, but I wanted to move out or zoom out and look at the macro length scale with radiology images. One of the uh, big opportunities with radiology images is that there is you know, macro level textures that can still be very beneficial in being able to distinguish different uh, similar appearing pathologies. And here's an example of similar appearing pathologies. One of the projects that we've been working on, uh, which is funded through an NCI R01 with Dr. Pallavi Tiwari at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, is trying to distinguish between radiation necrosis and recurrent tumors uh, in the context of patients with GBM or, or leoblastoma multiforme. And the challenge is that these patients undergo chemo radiation, they get an MRI scan, and when they get that follow-up MRI scan, something shows up on the scan, and it's not immediately clear whether one is looking at radiation necrosis or one is looking at tumor recurrence. And so we developed an approach called collage. And essentially the idea was to analyze the MRI scans and identify the dominant edge at every voxel or every pixel in the image. Having done that, we could then compute a quantitative measure of the disorder with respect to these gradient orientations. In other words, we were able to capture uh, a measure of entropy associated with these gradient orientations. And if you recall, your high school physics, entropy really captures the degree of disorder in the system. So if you see a high level of entropy, it essentially reflects a great deal of disorder in these gradient orientations. Um, that is, they're discordant with respect to each other. On the other hand, if you see a lower level of entropy, it reflects a um, more uh, contiguity, more homogeneity in terms of the orientation. And so when we applied the entropy measurements on top of these gradient vectors, uh, we actually were able to generate color maps like this, where the left panel, uh, you can see is a lot more entropy, a lot more heterogeneity. The right panel has a lot less entropy, a lot more homogeneity. And of course, it turns out that the more entropy, the more heterogeneity is associated with tumor recurrence and the radiation necrosis is associated with a lower degree of heterogeneity. Uh, we've taken this approach and applied it to uh, prognosticating outcome and also uh, predicting benefit of therapy in early stage non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, what we found is that this entropy feature is, uh, is really implicated with treatment response and treatment benefit, not just within the tumor, but in fact, outside the tumor, in the peritumoral environment. And, and in a publication from a couple of years ago, we showed that the immune uh, uh, sort of milieu around the tumor as captured by these entropy features allowed us to not just prognosticate recurrence, but really specifically identify uh, patients uh, who would truly benefit from uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. This concept of entropy and looking at the peritumoral milieu, uh, we found has uh, had implications in multiple other domains as well. This is work that we published a few years ago in the context of breast cancer patients who were receiving neoadjuvant anthracycline therapy and showed that the entropy features around the tumor, again, were more strongly associated with treatment response. So in other words, um, the higher the entropy, um, the more likely these patients uh, were to respond to, um, um, to uh, neoadjuvant anthracycline therapy. On the other hand, uh, patients who tended to have much lower degree of entropy, uh, the less likely they were to have a uh, pathologic complete response uh, to neoadjuvant anthracycline therapy. So the logical question is what is going on outside the tumor? What, is the, what are these entropy features capturing? And so in a, in a paper from a few years ago in JAMA Network Open, we actually tried to study that question. We got a series of peritumoral biopsies in these women uh, who were undergoing uh, chemotherapy for breast cancer. Uh, got the biopsies, digitized the biopsies, and interrogated the immune milieu. And what was really stunning was that the entropy features that we were capturing from an MRI scan, right? This is a completely different scale compared to the biopsies. The, the entropy features tended to mirror the spatial architecture of the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes on the biopsies. This was really, really interesting um, because... Uh, what we're seeing here is that at the macro length scale on the MRI, the entropy patterns are being modulated by what's happening at a microscopic level. So 
that immune infiltrate and the architecture of the immune infiltrate seems to really have been modulating the entropy patterns and the radiomic textual patterns that we're capturing from the MRI. So again, sort of this cross um, talk between the different length scales uh, was really interesting. And it again, sort of gets towards uh, trying to open up the black box, really trying to get at a more deeper underpinning and understanding of what these features mean. Uh, we've taken this uh, entropy idea and applied it to a series of other uh, indications. This is uh, a study from a few years ago where we looked at uh, patients treated with immunotherapy across uh, multiple different sites. Uh, it was a multi-site, multi-agent study, very similar to the study that um, we, uh, we published last year of the biopsies. In this case, we were looking at CT scans of patients and showed that the entropy features both of the tumor, but also the peritumoral environment was strongly associated with response to immunotherapy. Like the previous study, we looked at atezolizumab, uh, nivolumab, as well as pembrolizumab and showed a strong association between the entropy features and outcome and response. But also, uh, just like with the breast cancer study, we showed an association with the lymphocytic infiltration patterns of the baseline biopsies. Again, with the focus, with the intent of really trying to get at interpretability of uh, these, these radiomic features. In a follow-on paper from last year, we looked at patients undergoing combination therapy, uh, specifically in the context of stage three non-resectable, uh, non-small cell lung cancer patients who get uh, chemo radiation followed by drovalumab. And in this study, uh, we actually showed that radiomic uh, features, the entropy features of the tumor and the peritumoral environment from a baseline CT scan uh, was strongly associated uh, with outcome, in this case, progression-free survival in these patients. And what was really interesting was that that association held up independent of the PDL1 expression. So regardless of whether we had low or high PDL1 expression, you could see a real value add and risk stratification uh, that came about on account of these radiomic features between the low risk and the high risk groups. Uh, I, I sort of keep coming back to the importance and the necessity of validating these findings on clinical trial data sets. And so uh, just recently at the SITSI meeting, we showcased uh, the validation of this signature on CP1108. Uh, this was a collaboration with AstraZeneca, where we got access in a blinded fashion to the scans from AstraZeneca. We ran our signature on the, uh, on, on the CT scans and demonstrated that this, um, this uh, feature uh, was associated with response as well as uh, survival and, and a publication based on this is being written up. Um, we, we talked about entropy, we talked about texture patterns, but what about tumor associated vasculature? Been very, very interested in looking to understand how tumor associated vasculature is associated with treatment response. In a paper that we published last summer in clinical cancer research, we showed that the twistedness of the tumor-associated vasculature, not just the amount of vasculature, the twistedness of the vasculature was associated with pathologic complete response in breast cancer patients undergoing new adjuvant chemotherapy. In other words, the higher the degree of twistedness, the more likely it was that these patients were not going to respond to new adjuvant chemotherapy. On the other hand, the smoother the vasculature, the more likely these patients were to respond to chemotherapy. Uh, in, in a paper that uh, just came out in Science Advances over Thanksgiving, so just about two months ago, um, we showed that the twistedness of the tumor-associated vasculature was also implicated in response to checkpoint inhibitors. And so when we looked at patients who did or did not respond to immunotherapy, we found there were significant differences in the twistedness and the convolutedness of the tumor-associated vasculature. We found that patients who tend to respond had a much smoother vasculature compared to patients who didn't respond who had a much more twisted convoluted vasculature. And that not only was this twistedness associated with treatment response, it was also associated with overall survival and progression-free survival. In fact, there was also an association between the vessel twistedness and PDL1 expression. Um, and then finally, just to end, you know, I've talked about pathology, I talked about radiology. What about putting those together? And so one of the things that our group has been really focusing on, and this is an example from some work we're doing in small cell lung cancer, is how can we combine these feature patterns, the immune milieu and immune architecture from the pathology images, uh, along with the entropy features 
uh, both in the tumor as well as the peritumoral environment from the CT scans? Can we combine these features and show that we can better prognosticate outcome, better predict treatment response? So that's exactly where uh, we've been focusing on. Uh, we've demonstrated uh, that the combination actually is much uh, stronger in terms of signal and being able to predict outcome and treatment response. Uh, and, and we believe that we could really take this approach, this paradigm of combining RAD and PATH and apply it to a whole plurality of different indications. So with that, I'd like to conclude. So hopefully what I've conveyed is that computational analytics with routine imaging can help address questions in cancer immunology. Uh, and, and I focus primarily on prognosis and predicting treatment response. Uh, regardless of the choice of AI approach, I think there's no question that we need to establish multi-scale disease associations, really being able to establish the morphologic and molecular underpinning of these features is going to be critical. There's no question we have to extensively and rigorously validate these approaches, as well as evaluate the reproducibility of approaches and do that across multiple different populations. I want to finally just uh, end by thanking the amazing team of scientists, students, um, postdocs, faculty, colleagues that I have the pleasure and honor of working with. And of course, just a quick shout out to the funding agencies that put food on the table. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Manabushi. It's a tremendous amount of interesting work. So really appreciate your walking us through all that. We'll try to run quickly through some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, and we have a couple of questions focused on, you know, things that you may have tried to improve the accuracy of prediction. And so the first one was whether you tried to combine image classifier with Oncotype DX to see whether that improved the accuracy. Yeah, thank you for that question. We actually did uh, do some of that work um, back in, I think, 2017 or 2018. Uh, we had an abstract at ASCO where we did exactly that. Uh, we combined the image classifier with Oncotype DX and actually demonstrated, particularly for the low Oncotype DX group, that we could that the combination actually improved uh, the performance of Oncotype alone by about 20%. In other words, we could identify 20% more truly low-risk patients who could successfully avoid adjuvant chemotherapy. Thank okay. you for that question. Yeah. Uh, did you ever get phenotype of both innate and adaptive immune cells and TME and combine it with image classifier and see whether that would be more informative? That's a great question. And I think that's exactly where we wanna go. Um, we have not yet done that uh, phenotyping. We've just started to, uh, as I showed, you know, really just um, very, very preliminary data with, um, looking at sort of that uh, you know, immune phenotyping, looking at things like uh, quantitative immunofluorescence. We just started a project now uh, looking at uh, you know, spatial transcriptomics. So we'll start to get to that finer, more granular immune phenotyping and then start to combine it with uh, other kinds of image features. Um, I, and I think this is what I wanted to put out there. This, you know, we've really just scratched the surface. I think there's a tremendous opportunity uh, to really bring in uh, the, the more deeper granular um, sort of uh, immunology information and really combine it with a lot of these uh, features from standard imaging standard data. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I know you talked about the, the component of race. We had a question on whether you also looked at other patient characteristics like age, time of onset of cancer, the cancer diagnosis, sex, etc. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so everything that we do I didn't really have uh, time to get into the details, but in every study, we always do a very rigorous multivariable, uh, multivariate analysis to look at the codependency of uh, clinical pathologic factors. Um, and what was interesting in, in, in these studies, I mean, I showed the data with the uterine cancer, but we have similar data in breast cancer. We have similar data in prostate cancer that we published on a few years ago in clinical cancer research. Um, these, these morphologic differences that we're seeing across populations um, you know, turn out to be independently prognostic and independently associated with outcome uh, in a multivariate setting. So uh, we try to account the best we can for a, a number of those factors that were just mentioned um, and found consistently that these morphologic differences persist uh, even in that multivariable setting. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be something there. Of course, we've got to continue to explore uh, we've only found these differences morphologically. The question, of course, is molecularly, what does it mean? Um, and we clearly need to get more sophisticated and use things like spatial transcriptomics and single cell to really probe, you know, the underpinnings of these differences. Right. 
Okay. Uh, we had a question about what the tissue was that you looked at for both COVID-19 and H1N1 patients. Uh, so that those were our patients uh, who had been autopsied, um, and we looked at uh, lung tissue. Lung tissue. Okay. So then we had a question, um, you know, from a PhD, PhD student who's interested in translational research and would like to know your thoughts on opportunities and challenges of integrating these high-end computational tools in the clinical settings of developing countries. Great question. Um, so we've, um, so I see uh, my program officer from NCI is actually on the call, Dr. D.D. Rao. So it gives me an opportunity to talk about uh, a grant uh, from the NCI that we recently funded on where Dr. Rao is actually the, is, uh, is working with us. Um, and this is a partnership with, um, with India, with the Tata Cancer Center. And specifically as part of this five-year U01, we are working with the Tata Cancer Center to deploy these AI tools from routine pathology images to be able to create population-tailored models for breast cancer, oral cavity cancer, as well as prostate cancer. The main idea in, in, in low-middle-income countries uh, and, and sort of resource-scarce settings mm -hmm. is to be able to identify which patients truly will benefit from the treatment resources. Because right. you know, there, you're not just talking about patient toxicity, you're talking about a uh, qualified amount of resources that are available. So you've got to make sure that the, that the patients who are truly going to benefit from right. the therapy are the ones who benefit from the therapy. And so uh, very exciting project that we've just kicked off. Um, I hope in the coming days to be able to report on some of the initial findings from that study. That's fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I really, uh, such fascinating and innovative work, and we really appreciate your taking the time to both present and then answer questions from our audience. Absolutely. Thank you also to all the attendees for participating in today's webinar and for submitting questions. We're so glad, as always, to have you join us, and we look forward to many more engaged discussions. I'll just let you know that the next um, Immunome Lab meeting will be on Wednesday, February 8th at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, please note it's a Wednesday, not a Thursday for next month, and we will be hosting that day Dr. Jian Tang from the Mila Quebec AI Institute. There's no need to register for the webinar in advance. Please just visit our website at humanimmunomeproject.org to obtain the link. And while you're there, I invite you to please sign up for the newly launched Immunome Report, which is another platform for sharing the research and voices of scientists working at the frontiers of human immunology and AI. And finally, please do visit our website and follow us on social media, where we will post a recording of today's webinar. Um, thank you again for participating today, and we look forward to seeing you next month at the Immunome Lab meeting. Thank you so much, Dr. Matabushi. Pleasure. Thank you.